Word of Life family, good evening. I am so glad to see you, to be here. I am so excited to share from the Bible, from the Word of God, our sword, our life. And uh, would, you open, <coughs> would you open your Bible to John chapter 5? John chapter 5, if you have one, if you don't, you can follow on the screen screen and uh, also very important that we open our hearts because um, that's when the Bible will speak to us when we open our hearts to it. So John chapter 5 verse 1, we're going to be here today and I hope that you're going to be blessed and so this is the story. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay multitudes of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going Another steps before me. Jesus said to him, get up and take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the men who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the men who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The men went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. So this is our passage today. Let me just real quick put my notes. And so real quick, um, just to recap the story, this is uh, Jesus would be, you know, going, he's just going making rounds in Galilee, north of Palestine, if you know what that looks like. And then he would go to Jerusalem on a feast like this one, and Jesus would go to this um, place called Bethesda. And there, uh, Jesus would see, and I believe Jesus is actually motivated to come to this place because there is this man. There is this man who's an invalid. There's this man who's been suffering for so, so long. So Jesus seeks him out. Jesus then would uh, ask him a question. You know, he, he finds this man, and by the way, maybe some of your Bibles, they, they say that there's an angel who would come and stir up the waters. And, uh, but most new Bible versions do not have that story of the angel. And I, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Have you heard in Sunday school? And the reason is because the very, very earliest manuscripts or evidence of the Gospel of John did not have this story. And so then somebody else added it possibly as an explanation for what has happened here you know, with the water being stirred, but that's okay, that's okay. We have confidence in the word of God. By the way, the long, the farther we go from the original Bible, the closer we get to it because we have so much more evidence and fragments. And so, you know, there would be this water would stir up and most people think it's a spring. How many of you love springs? I know some, a lot of older parents, you guys go to Canada or you go to Soul Duck. That place stinks, but you, you understand what it is. It's like a spring of like bubbles up. And so what people believe is that this was that place and that it would just bubble up. The water would just kind of bubble, start bubbling, stir up. And there would be, I guess, a kind of superstition that if you step in, if you're first, you would get healed. And so Jesus finds this many. He says, Jesus, uh, uh, do you want to be healed? Now, at first glance, that seems like a, what is Jesus talking about? Like, why is he asking this man, do you want to be healed? And I, at first glance, that looks like an awkward question. But I, if you think about it, that's much better than saying, how are you doing? How's your life been? What's new, my man? How's it going? Jesus 
is getting to the point, to the need of this man. And I want to tell you that God also treats us like this. He gets to our need. He gets to our need quick. And so Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And then this man explains the story. And he says, look, Jesus. And what he gives is an explanation of why he's not healed. Because he has no buddies. He can't, he's not quick. He can't get up in time. And this same explanation, what I've realized, is also a request for Jesus. This is how you can also help me. See, this is an invitation to Jesus. And this is not going to be the first time this man is going to kind of get Jesus wrong. There's going to be a second time in this story. I don't know if you can think of when he gets something wrong again. But he would be offering Jesus, Jesus, here's an explanation of why I'm not healed. Here's also a way for you to heal me. Help me out, Jesus. Be my buddy. Spot me. Let's wait for this stir up. And then put me into this pool. And I want to tell you what's interesting about this is he's saying, Jesus, this is the method of healing. I want you to get in on this. And I want to tell you that sometimes God promises a need for to us, but we get all about the method. You see, God promises, for example, this provision that all of us are going to have food on our tables. Now, the kind of job you're going to have, how much money you're going to make, that's not necessarily promised. You see, sometimes we want God to get in on the methods and the planning of ours, but God is promising the result that we're going to be taking care of, that we're going to have food, that we're going to have clothes, that we're going to have shelter. That's the miracle is that not one of us has gone hungry. And so God meets our need always, not necessarily the method, but let's, we can still pray to God. And so then Jesus, uh, he heals this man. He heals this man, and the Jews come because Jesus did this on a Sabbath. And this was like outright, you don't do anything on a Saturday. And they asked Jesus, who, this man, who did this to you? And he really did not know who Jesus was. He really did not know. And then, I love this part about Jesus so much. Jesus would find him again. Because you see, Jesus had to run away. He had to slip away. Because Jesus, his primary focus is not healing. His primary focus is the spread of the kingdom of God. And so as he was practical, if he did one healing, then there would be a total like chaos and so many people. And he needed to spread the word. He, would, he disappeared. And so Jesus didn't finish his business with this man. God always finishes with us what he starts. And he returns on the second meeting to this man. And he tells him, hey, you have been made well. Sin no more that nothing may, worse may happen with you. That's like a tweet. Okay, so Jesus just comes there and gives him a sentence. What really probably happened is much longer, and probably it's implied that Jesus would introduce himself, and this man would get to know Jesus. That's what Jesus wanted him to know, is to know him, and to be challenged to follow him because he was healed for holiness. And so then, but you know where this man messes up? And this is where I was shocked, because when I read this story, when this man finds out who healed him, he goes and tells the Jews. Now, how many of you think that's a good thing? Like, I thought this was an amazing thing. This guy is spreading the fame of Jesus. Actually, and this is what commentators agree on, is he ended up betraying Jesus. He ended up going and telling on Jesus so he wouldn't get in trouble with the religious leaders. You know what I realized? Do you know who the kind of people are that can betray Jesus. It's not the world. It's us. It's people who know Jesus. We are the insiders. We are the part of the family. We are the ones that can betray Jesus. Just like this man, until he didn't know Jesus, he couldn't. But once he found out, he betrayed Jesus. And so then Jesus, they, he would be persecuted. And Jesus responds and says, my father is working and so I am working. Hey, I want to give you guys five things from this story that we learn about Jesus. You see, all of the whole gospel of John is about telling us that Jesus is God. He's human and he's God. 
But not only that, he tells us the kind of God he is. What kind of God is he? And in this way, in the way that Jesus confronts and helps this man in his need, we will find five main characteristics of the kind of God that you and I worship, the kind of Jesus that is our Jesus. Can I give you five things we learn about Jesus from this story? Number one, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is compassionate. Hey, the pool, the pool did not care about this man, of course. People ignored this man. Nobody cared. Everybody ignored this man. Jesus would come, walk the distance, come to this guy specifically because he had, was overcome with compassion. The Bible, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded at least nine times that Jesus is overcome with compassion. And Jesus would come to this man. And actually, some Bible versions say that Jesus learned about this man. He asked about this man. You know what happens when you learn? You ask questions. Here we have nobody who cares, no, everybody who ignores, and Jesus comes onto the scene and says, tell me about this man. What's going on? And Jesus finds out that he's 38 years an invalid. Friends, that's like a prison sentence. He's not 38 years old, most likely, but he's 38 years in this situation. And Jesus has incredible compassion. I want to tell you that our God is compassionate over us. He has compassion over our troubles. He has compassion over our problems, over our needs. And I know that somebody here might say, Eugene, I think my problem is big. But I don't think people think my problem is big. You know, in our church, we have somebody who on a wheelchair. In our church, we may have somebody who has cancer. In our church, we have people maybe with family problems. In our church, we have people who are worried about the kind of college they're going to go to. In our church, we have people who cannot buy a house and people who have enough money to buy a house but don't know what, to, what house to buy. We have people with all kinds of problems. And you might say, you know, Eugene, whatever I'm going through, I don't have a 38-year kind of problem. You know, I, I'm just, I think it's a problem, but you know, people have something more. I want to tell you, there's a passage in the Bible that says that we have a high priest. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You know what that means? The Bible does not distinguish levels of weaknesses, of troubles, of problems. Jesus is equally compassionate over us, over every problem. You know, I was thinking about my kid, my kids. And I think you guys, parents, you can, you know this. You know, kids, like my boys, uh, there's problems that they have, like real problems. And then there are, in their own mind, problems that they have. You know, so over here, they can be sick, they're hurting, they can have ear infection, pink eye, fever, constipation, on and on and on. They, could, they can break their arms, they fall, they get hurt. Those are real problems. And then over here, and they're always crying, by the way. And over here is their own idea of, the kind, of what they think is problem. So in my children's case, if we pull them away from their grandparents too soon, if we don't let... Zeke put ranch in his milk. If we don't, he can't eat Skittles for dinner or candy. If he can't have, you know, scissors and cut things. If he can't draw on the wall. If we didn't buy him a toy that he wants at the store. Those are his problems. Now, he has problems. But you know what? I realized something as a parent. And I want to tell you that whenever there's a good quality in parenting, I believe that God is asking us, we could actually infer that God is even more like this. Remember when Jesus talked about the bread and how a dad will not give their daughter a stone when they ask for a bread? How much more does the father care for us? Well, here's the thing. When my son is really suffering, I am broken for him. And you know what I realized? I'll be honest. When my son is 15 minutes into crying because of his cartoon that he didn't get to watch, I'm also compassionate. I'm also broken. 
And I want to tell you that God is equal. You know, we have our different problems, and they can be all over the place. But I want to tell you, God is compassionate. He understands your problem. Yeah, it's not maybe the same league as other people's problems, but he understands. I want to tell you, every single person, when God looks at your problem, he sees a 38-year kind of problem. He is compassionate. He is compassionate. The second thing that we learn about Jesus from this story is notice what Jesus does. He encounters this man where he is. See, how does this man get healed? Well, he has to have a buddy or he has to find a way to get to the pool. He has to come to the pool. In this story, Jesus comes to the man. Jesus encounters this man as he is. I want to tell you something. God encounters us as we are. In our brokenness, he is there. In our pain, he is there. Even in our sin, he is there. How do I know? Because you know, you're only a one prayer away, wherever you are in life, from full healing in him. From full restoration in him. And you can be in sin, but you know what? You don't have to clean up your act, shape up, and come to God. No, you just get on your knees. And what does that mean? It means that he's there with you. He's there listening. He meets us as we are. And do you know why God does this? Because he loves us. And you know why he loves us? The greatest kind of love. And I want, to, I want us to understand this. The greatest kind of love is not loving us for who we are. He loves us as we are. He doesn't love us because of who we are. He loves us in spite of who we are. Because the Bible says while we were yet sinners, what happened? Jesus died for us. And why did he die for us? Because God so loved the world. So what we find, and I want to tell you, that is so, so big. Because if we think, let me give you a couple of things why it's a problem to think God loves me because of who I am. Number one, he would never meet you where you're at. You would need to meet him. You would need to achieve holiness, righteousness, put up your act, get and meet him where he's at. You know what? But he loves us in spite of who we are, so we meet him. Number two, if God loves us only because of who we are, then that's a really dangerous place to be in. Because that means any change in who I am changes the love of God. And so maybe if I get a little better, God loves me a little more. But if I get a little worse, God loves me a little worse. But I have news for you. The greatest news is that we are not part of the equation of God's love. God's infinite love loves us in spite of who we are. And so that's why God comes to this man. He doesn't demand that he would come. Do you know that this man doesn't even demonstrate his faith? He, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. He's talking about something else. And Jesus gets him right where he's at. You know, my boy, one more family story. But I'll sometimes really torture my son. And I'll ask him, hey, you know, why do I love you so much? And my, I think my son has the best reply. And he says in Russian, you know, I'll, I'll just won't do it. But he says, I don't know. I want to tell you, that is the greatest position for us to have. Why does God love me? I don't know. But you know what that means? He loved me in the past. He loves me in the present. He loves me in the future because he doesn't love me for who I am. He loves me in Christ infinitely and his love will never change. So God has this incredible love for this man. He meets him where he is. But listen, if Jesus could just be compassionate, if Jesus goes the distance to meet this man where he is, so what? But you know what? The point number three that we learn about Jesus is he's powerful to meet our need. He's powerful to meet our need. While Jesus wants to meet him where he's at, he's not content leaving him like that. He gets him up. He gives a real solution. Friends, we, learn, we serve a God with real solutions. Let me jump to number four. We also find in this 
text that Jesus is after relationship. Because Jesus would come the second time around and he would introduce himself. Jesus would challenge him to holiness and say, sin no more. Do you know why? What is Jesus doing? Jesus is calling this man into a deeper relationship. Our God doesn't just give us gifts and blessings. He doesn't just answer our problems and our needs. But you know what? When God blesses us, what he wants is a relationship. He wants us to know him, know his name, and be challenged to holiness, to follow after him. The pool didn't do that. People don't do that, but God is so good that he doesn't just want you to have your answer. He wants you to have him. He wants you to have a solution. Amen? And number five, and this is where I really get excited. Jesus, and I'll give you this point in a little bit. But you know what? He's confronted about doing this miracle on a Sabbath. Jesus could have done this miracle tomorrow. And he could have done this miracle yesterday. Why did Jesus do this miracle on a Sabbath? Why did Jesus do this miracle on a Sabbath? Now, listen, in other parts of the Bible, maybe Jesus did a miracle on a Sabbath to challenge the leaders, the religious leaders. Maybe he did it on a Sabbath to show that he is God. But in this context, the reason why Jesus does this miracle on a Sabbath is here. Because Jesus wanted to show that his work in your and my life is never interrupted. It never takes a break. And what kind of work are we talking about? Works of compassion, encountering us, healing us, providing for us, giving us the power to get out of our mire and to be in a deeper relationship with him. That work is on repeat. That work never, ever stops. Because Sabbath, I mean, how silly would that be if God took a break on a Sabbath? I'm going to tell you, equally silly it is when we think that God doesn't disappoint our expectations. When God, there's things God cannot do. There's people God does not work with. There's problems God does not get into. That's too small for God, but that's a little too big. God's work of having compassion over you, of encountering you in your brokenness, of having the power to help you and calling you deeper into relationship, that work is on repeat. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things in the present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing stops God's work. So what do we have here? We have a God who is so compassionate, who goes the distance to meet us in our brokenness, who has the power to help us and restore us to a relationship on repeat in our lives. And you know what? The greatest news is Jesus is our Bethesda. Do you know what Bethesda means? House of mercy. Jesus is the Lord of mercy. He is the pool. But you know what? Before we end, I want to say this. While Jesus is better than this pool, we can sometimes have our pools where we try to solve our problems, our needs. And you know what? I have my issues or my anxiety or my problems, but I'm going to wait on my pool to bubble, my job to come. I have my issues, my problems, but I know what will solve it my future girlfriend or boyfriend. 
I'll know we'll solve it. A good, good job. I'll know what we'll, I'll know what we'll, what we'll, what we'll solve. My pool called approval. My pool called possessions. My pool called money. And Jesus is standing by. He is Bethesda. He is the Lord of mercy. We got to come to him. We got to get rid of our pools. We got to get rid of these things. Friends, I want to tell you that it, for sickness, Jesus is our healing. For sin, Jesus is our forgiveness. For loneliness, Jesus is our best friend. For anxiety, Jesus is our still waters. And for insecurity, Jesus is the stronghold of love. And in our lack, Jesus is our more than enough. Jesus is Bethesda. He is the pool we need. He is the pool we're looking for to solve our problems and our issues. And he's there standing. Draw near to him. Stand with me and pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that we would come to you because you have come to us. Lord, I pray that we would respond in faith. We would respond in acceptance. Lord, for anybody here who has been distant from you, that whatever their distance is, God, let them that, that, that not stop them because you meet them there, God. You offer your forgiveness. You offer your peace. You offer your friendship. You offer your power to help them. Jesus, thank you so much for what your word teaches us about you. We thank you that you're compassionate. We thank you that you go the distance to meet us. We thank you that you have power to help us. We thank you so much that you call us and draw us into a deeper relationship and you do this on repeat. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace, your blessings, your love. Amen.